joining us now to talk about all of that is the author of The End of Big, How the Internet Makes David the New Goliath. And uh, we say hello to uh, Nico Mealy. He's the author of the book, and he uh, is also um, a member of the uh, faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, welcome, Nico. How are you, sir? My pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Good well, afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Before, you know, and we're going to talk about Hillary Clinton in a little bit. Uh, you wrote a piece of uh, Politico um, about her and her, her prospects for 016, which I want to get to. But this is, you know, th th this book is so correct. Um, <clears throat> you don't need me to tell you that, but it's so relevant because I, I just had the conversation. I was walking the dog the other day, and I, I, I was talking to a, a, a father of a, a high school age girl. She's just in high school. And he's just, we're just talking about, he was talking about how Twitter and Facebook and this one got that one mad. And, and, we've, and just a big story today, a girl was bullied and she committed suicide. I, I mean, this, this is a, a whole new world, which I don't know that we know how to handle. Well, I'm not sure we do. The, there's an enormous amount of power that has changed, that has shifted over the last 35 years. You know, in 1969, a Cray supercomputer would fill an auditorium and cost five million bucks. And really only the Pentagon and some big universities had them, and a couple big companies. Today, your average iPhone 4 is actually slightly more powerful than uh, the Cray supercomputer of the 70s. <laughs> and so think about that. Two-thirds of Americans walking around with supercomputers in their pockets, always connected, it's it's a, it's a massive sea change in 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 society, in relationship, in institutions, and most importantly, in the distribution of power. And what that comes to politics, and of course, as the webmaster for Howard uh, Dean's campaign, and then working on uh, Barack Obama's 2004 Senate campaign, uh, you have used all of this to your greatest advantage in those two instances. This, when you distribute the power across two thirds of Americans you create enormous opportunities for underdogs. It wasn't just our Dean in 03, of course he lost, or Obama in 04, 08, and 2012. I mean, the fact that Barack Obama, a man pretty new to public life, could defeat Hillary Clinton when the Clintons invented, built the modern Democratic Party was stunning. And then you look at what the Tea Party has done in the, in the last two political cycles in, in Republican primaries. I mean, we have, uh, we have a, a dozen U.S. Senate primaries where the establishment Republican, including three sitting U.S. senators, lost to a Tea Party insurgent. And that's really – that kind of insurgent power is unprecedented in American history. And it, it makes it very hard to be to be the establishment, to be in charge. Well, yes, yes, to a degree. Uh, let, me, let me just bring up a – throw a monkey wrench into this, which you may or may not want to get into or acknowledge, but I'd be interested to hear your point of view, given your background, certainly. Um, Howard Dean, you know, uh, maybe a bad example. Barack Obama – had the media on his side. Not only did he was he able to take care of uh, or to take advantage of social media, certainly more so in in the uh, in, in 08 in the presidential election itself. Uh, but but uh, you know he had the media on his side for various reasons. Um, and many incumbents, uh, if they're Democrats, will always have the media on their side. But what's made it more amazing for Tea Party or insurgents, as you put it, I don't particularly like that word, and and others uh, on the right, whoever, uh, and the Tea Party itself, they've done that in spite of the media coverage? Well, I mean, I think that it, when it was Obama versus Hillary in the primary, the media was not on his side. The media was, was, was really thought there was no way he could beat Hillary. And we don't have to use the word insurgent. We can use the word challenger. My whole point is that if you are the perceived front runner, the perceived winner, the Internet is leveling the playing field. It's getting rid of that advantage, including the advantage of the media. Okay, well, uh, let, let, when we're talking uh, to uh, Nico Mealy, uh, the uh, author of The End of Big, uh, here on the Steve Malzberg Show. There's, there's the book. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Hillary. And I have all kinds of sound bites, which we don't need to play. I mean, I have a – actually, there's an Ariana Huffington one, which is very, very interesting. It's a little long, but uh, I, I'd like you to hear this. She was on ABC uh, this week, I believe, uh, on Sunday, and this is eight, um, Will. Let's listen to cut number eight, and um, very interesting. No, no, she's obviously running, but what I was hoping is that she would have taken more time to become what she called herself, untired. 
You know, after all, untired. she untired. That was her term. You know, she wanted to sleep in, to be able to recharge herself. She hasn't given herself that time. And I think that's sending a bad message to women, that the only way to succeed, the only way to run is to drive yourself into the ground. After all, she collapsed. She had a concussion. And right now, you see a greater debate among corporations, among individuals, how we can redefine success, how we can actually reduce stress and burnout, which is having a terrible impact on our health care system. 75% of health care costs are because of chronic preventable diseases, many of them brought about by stress. She could, she could be an incredible leader in helping us do our life and our success differently. Not let me ask you this, and the reason I played that, and there was a piece written about you and your book uh, on Politico uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, it was titled, one, one Person Says Hillary Clinton's No Shoe In, and it was about you and your book and, and what you thought. It, it, does, does the fact that we are so connected make it almost impossible for Hillary to do what she said she would do, which was, you know, all we heard was, I'm going to rest, and I'm going to, like, like uh, Ariana was referring to, I'm going to just take it easy, I'm going to enjoy not working, and, you know, she hasn't stopped, now she's going on a book tour, then she's writing a book, then she's here, then she's there, so does the, does the, 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 uh, the internet make it, and the, the age we live in, make it almost uh, foolish for her to disappear for, for a while? Oh, yeah. It's foolish for anybody to disappear, uh, you know, especially for someone with political ambition. You know, we live in we went we went from we, in 1980. Most American households had three, maybe four television channels. About a decade later, in the early 90s, most Americans have basic cable. You got 30 or 40 channels today. You'll have three or four hundred channels plus your satellite radio plus the internet plus apps on your mobile devices there's just a huge volume of outlets and if you want to be uh if you if you want to be a leader in this day and age you have to reach as many people as possible across as many outlets as possible with the greatest frequency possible it's positively exhausting and and your theory that uh, hillary is no shoe in in 2016 um, is that mean on the Democratic side if she were, uh, chooses to be the be a, a candidate, or or do you mean? Uh, well, my, my my theory is really that um, that Americans have all this power with their smartphones and the internet, and they want to bestow that power on a leader and create the leader. They don't want a leader who's been created or who's who's been created already by their own uh, accomplishments or by other other things. You know, in in the political piece you keep talking about, I, I say that, you know, six million people gave a hundred dollars to Barack Obama because they believed that by giving him a hundred bucks, they were making him. He could not be president if they didn't give the money. No one is gonna believe that their hundred dollars to Hillary matters. And everybody believed that about Obama, at least in 08. Well, that's interesting. And you also talk about how if she runs against a Joe Biden or an Al Gore or something like that, then she'll do okay. But if there is, a, and again, you use the word insurgent, so I'm glad to see you use it on a Democratic side, too, uh, that if there is a, a, an unknown or a relatively unknown uh, person, you know, much the way Bill Clinton came out of uh, nowhere uh, back when he ran um, to, uh, to, uh, to challenge Hillary, uh, that they, they would have a shot uh, against her. But when, when Bill Clinton ran, uh, I would say he wasn't necessarily an insurgent because there was – to be an insurgent, you have to be running against an establishment character. Right, you have right. To be running against the establishment. But he just had one ingredient. He was un, uh, relatively unknown. He was relatively yeah. unknown. He was still a governor of a fairly large state. And, and the big thing is that you, if you wanted to help Bill Clinton be elected president, it wasn't like you could go online and right. help make that happen, have a tangible role in it, Right. Whereas you look at like Ted Cruz in Texas, you want him to be a U.S. senator, you go and give money to him, you can make him a U.S. senator. The Internet distributes the power and the ability to do that. No, it's very interesting. I have one more aspect of the, uh, the uh, Internet and the age in which we live uh, to run by you, and that, of course, uh, Nico, is the, uh, the economy. And, and, and how, you know, the new normal. We're hearing so much, and there's a term for it uh, that I was listening to um, uh, the, the uh, CNBC morning uh, show, um, uh, at, and they were talking about the term, and uh, one of them, Joe, Joe Kernan, I think, made a, a joke that he thought it was a disease. But, but this 
that these jobs that are gone may not come back. The unemployment level may not get back to where it was, that this would be the new normal. And uh, it, it's true for corporations that have downsized that are not going to rehire because they, they've learned how to do it with less. Jobs that people have lost or have gone away, they may not come back ever. Uh, so this is also uh, yeah. attributable to technology and the internet i know yeah, someone who yeah. was a big advertising executive you know back in the uh, in the, in the 90s or early 90s or late 80s she was ph phenomenal she left to have family whatever she'd like to go back to that industry she can't because what was done by artists and and done meticulously and 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 uniquely now anybody could do online there's definitely been a dramatic change in our economy in 1820 most americans 90 percent plus were essentially self-employed farmers. By 1920, most Americans, 90% plus, were employed by corporations. And we're headed back in, in, to, by 2020 to a situation where the vast majority of Americans are, again, essentially self-employed, right? Either as solo consultants, solo operators, or as contract 1099 employees, not full employees, but contract employees. The, 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 the fundamental dynamics of our economy are shifting in a way that um, that is that is profoundly anti-institutional, where big companies are not are not keeping are, are not taking care of American workers in the same way. Yeah, listen, a fascinating topic. Uh, Nico Mealy, the uh, author of The End of Big, also of course uh, on the faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, thank you for sharing with us, sir. I hope you'll come thank back. You. My pleasure. Take care. All right, it is it it is.